Would someone, uh, would you all turn to Matthew chapter 5? Now I'm going to continue my series on conscience. And we can't do a series on conscience without discussing purity of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart. Matthew 5. And it's uh, the sixth beatitude. He says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now this is a very, very important theme. And has everything to do, as you'll see, with conscience. Now this is a great uh, insight in the title of a book I saw one time. and The title alone was just full of insight, as far as I'm concerned. Because it was called... To be pure of heart is to only want one thing. I want you to think about that. Everybody has a lot of wants. That's what it means to be a human being. I want this. I want that. I want to go to Florida. I want to feel the sun. I want a winter to come. I mean, we've got thousands of wants. But everybody in their deepest part of their soul has a master want. A want that you want more than anything else. And you're really in trouble if you got two or three of those. <laughs> I want to be with God. I want to be famous. I want to be rich. I want revenge. Man, you're in trouble because you're only made to have a master want. One want. To be pure of heart. That's what it means to be pure of heart. Pure purity of heart. It doesn't mean you're, not, you're living a perfect life and every single thing about you is right. Just being pure of heart goes right down the core of your being. You must be pure of heart to see God. you got to want God and his glory and to see him. This is the, uh, he says, blessed are the pure of heart. They will see God. This is the ultimate goal. Uh, this is the, what's called in theology the beatific vision. The goal for humanity is to see God. Okay. And that's what John says in his letter. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we are, what we are but, or what we shall be. But when we see him, we'll be like him. So the goal is to see God. Like there's a fantastic climactic verse in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. They shall see his face. So I want to see God. Only a pure heart can see God. You cannot want two or three things and see God. You've got to want one thing supremely and see God. To be pure of heart is to want one thing superbly. Not to be divided. There's another passage in the Bible that I wasn't even going to put in my sermon, but it comes to mind. Unite my heart, O Lord, that I might uh, see you, worship you. Unite my heart that I might worship you. A divided heart is a curse. Like, I want this, I want that. I want God, but I want the world. I want pleasure and God as much as each other. What? Now, I, I'm not going to take you there, but James, uh, there's a theme like this in James, the book of James. And I one time did a sermon on it called Beware of the Deadly Doubles. <laughs> Think about it. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. You, you, you know, you got to make up your mind what you're going to be and who you're going to be and what you want. And I, actually, you should go for it. The truth is, everyone will go for what they want. They may fool themselves for a while, but sooner or later, the master passion, the master heart is what we fall back on. The master desire of the heart. Everyone always ends up going for what they want. Sooner or later. Now, so you got to be pure of heart. Now, uh, let me take this from a different angle, but it's still in Matthew. Matthew has a lot to say about this in the teaching of Jesus. Um, everyone has a secret life, right? And, and there's many passages in Scripture that underline that. Like, I love that passage in Peter where he says, the hidden man of the heart. The hidden man of the heart. Everyone has a secret life. Now look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. 
Well, we'll just start in verse 1 to make sense of it. Take heed that you don't do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you... When you do your alms, he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, that your alms may be in secret. Now, this is a beautiful passage if you really meditate on it. That your father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. So God is a father and he's the father who sees the secret life. Everyone has a secret life. That's the part of us no one else sees but God. And that's a tremendously beautiful thing if you think about it. I have this thing with God that nobody else knows about but God and I. Okay. I have a part of my life that only God knows. Okay. Only God knows. And that's a good thing to cultivate, right? To not just be merely external and to live for the glory and praise of men. Because he said that's its own reward. But when the father that sees in secret, he can reward us openly. Now when God wants to reward a Christian, he doesn't put them on the cover of Charisma magazine <laughs> or elect them as Christian of the year. Okay, That would be a curse actually. No, one of the ways God rewards his people is he just answers their prayers. Just answer prayer. How, how many know that's such a joy to have an answer prayer? You prayed for something specifically, and God answered. <laughs> how many times has this church experienced it? Okay. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Now, look, we, um, it shouldn't ever be commonplace. Uh, really, God answered. We prayed for serious sick, sick people lately, and God has answered. Hallelujah. And we're not going to merchandise it and advertise it. Because look, the whole thing is the Father that sees in secret. When you fast and put on, you know, ointment and don't, you know, put on a long face, but let that be between you and the Father who sees in secret. When you pray, he's not saying don't have public prayer. I love public prayer. We need public prayer. But he says don't pray to be seen of men. Have a secret life. Everyone has one anyway. So you know what that tells me? The, the, according, this is the, your Savior. This is Jesus talking. That tells me that Jesus Christ considers your inner man to possibly be a sanctuary. What is the deepest part of your being for? Is it to uh, think about Minecraft all day long? or <laughs> Oh, let's go into NFL now. It's here. Or are you supposed to have a holy place inside, see. This is really, really, really important. An inner sanctuary. So therefore, to sin, uh, usually people think of sin as externals, but I'm going to talk about it as inner sin, is a desecration of a sanctuary. Okay, it's a serious thing. Very much a desecration, because I, my inner man is... For God, it's supposed to be a sanctuary of worship. We used to sing this song, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. If I'm holy as you are holy, I will seek your holy face. Seeing the face of Jesus is the goal, really. On that day when we see the face of Jesus, all the pain and sorrow and stress and strain of this world that we accumulated, that we don't even know, Okay, just drains out. <laughs> I mean, you know, we get, we, you know, even physically, we accumulate pains that we get used to, we don't even realize. Okay, so we're kind of limping along. And if you were all of a sudden transported back 20 years, you'd be shocked at how good you felt, right? I mean, what? I ever felt like that? Absolutely, you felt like that so much you never even thought about it. You just pick up all kinds of stuff. 
there's a beautiful <laughs> a beautiful movie that always illustrated this for me and and, and I, I don't usually cite movies or anything but Ben Hur not not the new one the old one with Charlton Heston okay and he's getting dragged across the desert which is really what the world's all about and his throat is parched and his lips are cracking his tongue sticking out of his mouth and then they stop at uh, Nazareth on the on the way to the slave markets and uh, he just, uh, the guards hate him, so they're, t they're tormenting Ben-Hur, and they pour water in front of him, but won't let him drink it. So much like the world, right? So, the, so this director really got something. So then he passes out in the sand, and then the guard just pours all the water out like five feet from him, so he can't even touch it. And then you see, and this is the class that they had in the 50s, the back of a carpenter in his shop who goes out and gets a gourd full of water and he doesn't care about the Roman soldiers and he bends down lovingly and picks up the head of this tormented man to put the water to his lips. But there's this scene in this movie where the man, before he even drinks the water, he looks up into his face and you see all the strain in his face just drain out. Like just like seeing him is victory over sin and sorrow and anguish, pain and torment and fear. And then there's a really funny scene that, like right after that, then this, this big burly guard comes menacing. But then when Jesus looked at him, he shrunk away. See, and I see the God speaking through that because for some people, the vision of the face of Jesus is the final blessed relief and the completion of all. For other people, it's terror, they're gonna shrink away, right? Like First John has this passage where it says that you not, um, uh, don't, I, I, I'm just paraphrasing, but it, it, it talks about that we might, might not be ashamed, but really what it says in the Greek is that we might not have to look away, okay? And then later on, he said that we might have confidence that it's coming. And what that literally says is that we might be able to look right at him. Okay. Jesus is coming, everybody. And the world's going to be polarized between those who have to look away and those who can look right at him, right? And what I'm going to talk about today has everything to do with that, okay? So your, your, your inner man is a sanctuary. And the Bible also tells us something very powerful. God knows our hearts. How many of you know that, right? God knows our hearts. God knows what goes on in our hearts. And there's a, another beautiful passage. <laughs> Getting off my notes, but that's all right. 1 John 3, he says, But brethren, if our hearts condemn us, how many of you have ever had that experience where your conscience hurts, you hurt, and you don't believe that you're worthy on any sense? If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. And man, did I ever ponder that and ponder that and pick at that for a long time. I couldn't figure out what that meant. I mean, when you think about it, what's he saying? What's he actually saying? But then it says he knows all things, right? And I realized something. John is remembering something that happened with Peter. After Peter had denied Christ three days, three times, I mean, and let Christ just be crucified and drug away, even though he said, I'll never do that. And now Jesus is confronting him again, and he sets it up perfectly so that Peter has to go back to that point. For example, there's only two places in the whole gospel that uses the word coal fire. One is there in 1 John 20, and the other one, or 21, and the other one is on the night Jesus was betrayed, Peter warmed himself by a coal fire. So Jesus gets out of, Jesus is on the shore after the resurrection and he fixes a coal fire. He's setting it up just like where, he takes you back to where you went wrong, right? How many know that? He'll take you right back. Don't fight it. Let him do it. And he said, Peter, do you love me? Like, 
the same kind of love you professed on the night I was betrayed. And now Peter, and Peter was so sure of that first time. Oh, yeah, I love you more than all these. Then Jesus, you love me more than these now? And Peter's not so sure. So he hesitates. He says, Lord, you know that I, I like you. I prefer you. He can't say, I love you with all my heart. I can't do it. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, how many are happy about that, that the only real requirement for pastoral ministry is love for Jesus? <laughs> do you love me? Feed my sheep. And he said, do you love me, Peter? Peter denied him three times. He's going to ask him, do you love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And Peter is troubled, but he thinks, he says, I can't say that. Uh, I like you. Feed my lambs. This is his commission. And the third time, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know everything. Okay. And that's the same thing that John said right here. If God, God's greater than your heart, he knows all things. If your heart condemns you, God knows everything. What's Peter really saying here? I think part of what he's saying is this. Look, I was sure I'd never deny you, but I did. Shocked me, but it didn't shock you. You knew from the day you called me what I was, who I am, who I think I am, as opposed to who I am. <laughs> you know everything. You know everything. Now, amazingly enough, that story and that verse in John, 1 John, is a salve for a troubled and bruised conscience. Jesus knows everything about us. And it didn't stop him from calling Peter and seeking to restore him. And it didn't stop him from calling you and from calling me. There are many, many stumbling blocks in this world. Many things that people trip up over. Many little slews, pitfalls, traps that are set by the adversary, let alone the fact that in many things we offend each other and don't even mean to. We're just human. Someone says, I won't go to church anymore. I got hurt there. <laughs> of course they will hurt you because all God has to build with are fallen but redeemed human beings. And of course you can be hurt in church. Okay. But that shouldn't let you make the ultimate uh, decision to just not have anything to do with the church. Church is the program of God. I'm preaching to the choir here. You're here. Okay, but I'm out there. Church is the program of God. Go to church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that just came over me. All right. Anyway. <laughs> God knows our hearts. One of the greatest psalms of all is Psalm 139. You know me. You know my uprising, my down sitting. You know the secrets of my heart. All right. Paul said the measure of a real church, if you're going to a real church, here's what to look for. What, a highly polished worship team? A professional pastor with a bad haircut? No. A real church, you walk in and the secrets of your heart are revealed. Now this keeps as many people out of church as it does brings them into church. Because some people want that and some people don't. Look, I don't like it, but I want it. I want the secrets of my heart revealed. I want to come to the light. Because I want a good conscience. And I want a secret life with God. And I want to really know God. Now look, a lot of people pick up jargon. Oh, I've got my own personal relationship with God. But what is a personal relationship with God? If it's not that your heart is a sanctuary for worship in your deepest part of your being. If you have no secret life whatsoever with God. Believe me, you have a secret life. It's either with God or without God. But everyone has a secret life. Everyone has a part of their life that people know about and a part of their life that nobody knows about but God. 
And the first thing I wanted to say in this, in this, as this message turns this way is that God knows all. And that, see, that's why Jesus uh, said at one point, uh, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Oh, what is hypocrisy? Well, hypocrisy is play acting, actually. You know those masks at theaters that symbolize the theater, like one smiling, one frowning? You know what those are called? They're called hypocrites. Did you know that? And hypocrisy is play acting. It's very dangerous to the soul and very injurious to the conscience. It's pretending to be something you're not or pretending not to be something you are. And Jesus said, look, hypocrisy is short-sighted. Okay. And what it, what it, he didn't put it in those words. I put it in those words. What he said is, there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. There's nothing secret that won't come out to the, to the light. So what's the best possible policy is to make up your mind that you're going to be real. You're going to be willing to be known for who you really are. Nothing more, nothing less. And the best place for that is in the church of God. The light. <laughs> we know each other. We're in the light. If we walk in the light, right? Now, let me talk specifically about sins of the mind, because sins of the mind are pr probably more dangerous to us than sins that we actually practice. The impure of heart cannot have a good conscience. It's just impossible. You can't have a good conscience. Okay. There's something, con the mind and the conscience are connected. Now, now look with me in a scripture in, in Paul, Titus 1. Now, they're dangerous. I always talk about secret sins as being dangerous because um, you, could, you could live in the illusion that, you know, that's, <laughs> I'm good and I'm a member in good standing and every, nobody knows. But that's not entirely true. God knows. God's the only one that counts, really. But secret sins um, are a direct assault on your conscience and on your, on your very soul. Uh, Sins of the mind, you know. Now, this message will only be beneficial to someone if they want a pure heart, if they want a real walk with God, if they want to know God. Now, Titus 1, 15. To the pure, all things are pure. Now, this is true. To the pure, everything's pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So your conscience can be defiled. That's a bad state to be in. Your mind can be defiled. And notice Titus, Paul says of Titus, he puts the mind and the conscience together. Your mind and your conscience defiled if you're impure. Now we've all remember from grade school and stuff like that, that the kid that uh, is dirty minded and can see a dirty joke in everything said, okay. And that's just a juvenile example of this. To the pure, everything's pure. To the unbelieving and defiled, nothing's pure. They, they defile everything because they are defiled in their sanctuary, in the place that's ordained for the worship of God. They have defilement. Now, Ezekiel had a very interesting vision one time where in the vision he's transported to Jerusalem. He's in captivity at a place called Tel Aviv. But he's transported to Jerusalem. He says, go in the temple. He goes in the temple and everything's as, as it should be. All the priests are doing their thing. There's a candelabra. There's a table of showbread, everything. He says, go deeper. Go deeper. And he goes back into the secret rooms of the temple. And he sees all the priests worshiping the sun and images of the sun and the sun god right on the wall right there. And then he says, go deeper. I'll even show you more abominations of these. It just kept going back further and further of abominations. That's a very serious, very serious warning in the Bible. I mean, the temple was about ready to be destroyed, and they needed to know why. Well, Ezekiel was given a vision why. To the core, to the sanctuary, to the deepest part. What? Desecration. But it's all okay because nobody sees it. Well, God does, right? God sees so sins of the mind are very dangerous, see, because inner sins and secret sins engage all your faculties. 
your mind, your emotions, your desires, your will. I mean, the truth is, like, you can't, nobody just spontaneously bursts out into an external sin. Every external sin comes from an internal sin. Like James says, everyone uh, sins when they conceive in their lust. And then lust comes forth like a baby in the womb. It develops. You don't see the baby, not for nine months. But then you see the baby. Just nobody just fell into adultery or something like that. And by the way, that, that, that's not the only sin that we're talking about. Not, it's not just sexual sin. Some people indulge in secret sins of hatred, bitterness, envy, folly even. Folly. You're supposed to think about, I mean, look, the, the, the highest application of your mind is the person of God. Theology. Okay. Now, you don't have to be a preacher, and you don't have to be a theologian, and you don't have to be some kind of super, super Christian. But Christians love God. So they think about him, right? They don't think about everything. Like, I still have to think about, I'm going to build a greenhouse for my wife. So I did a lot of thought about how we're going to construct that. Or we're going to put such and such in our garden. That's all legitimate. That's all fine. Even pleasure. We're going to go down to Florida and just get a little R&R. &R. We need it. That's fine. All, there's all kinds of things you can think about. But if you never <laughs> let your thoughts rise up, to the worship of God. And by the way, if you're defiled, you can't. You can't do it. Evil thoughts always lay the groundwork for the eventual concrete sins. Okay. Like Jesus said, we're just going through the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees thought all defilement is external. So the idea is to get yourself away from anything external and you'll never be defiled. And Jesus said, it's not that which comes out from the end that defiles a person. Out of the heart proceed. Evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, hatred, vengeance. I mean... He gives this exhaustive list. At any point, you're expecting someone to say, all right, all right, all right. But Jesus just keeps on because he wants us to see that there is a fountain of corruption that has to be dealt with. Uh, and this is, the, this is one of the things that brought me to Christ himself is the Sermon on the Mount because I actually was an externalist. I was Catholic and I thought, you know, I've never really committed adultery and I've never really murdered someone. But the Sermon on the Mount disabused me of that. It just troubled my conscience to show me that it's not mere externalism. It's the heart. The law of God speaks to the heart. So if you look on a woman to lust after her, you know, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. That's why the book of Proverbs says, uh, let me quote this verse. It's a great one. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flow the issues of life. Life flows out of the inner man, right? You used to guard your heart. I mean, lust and inordinate desire and wrong desire is sin. It's, it's sin, the 10th commandment. Paul said, you know, I was, I was fooling myself. I was thinking I kept every one of the commandments. He'd go through the commandments. Have I ever murdered anyone? No. Have I ever committed adultery? No. Perish the thought. Have I ever done this, done that, and that? But when he got to the 10th, he says, it slew me. It just killed me. Why? Because the tenth is entirely spiritual. You shall not covet. What is covet? You should not desire anything that the Lord your God has not given you. Now you're going to be tempted to. 
You, this world, <laughs> there are many offenses in this world. And so I grieve for young people and everything because it's so easy to indulge lust in this generation. And there's going to be people that hurt you, so you'll be tempted to have thoughts of vengeance or even fantasies of vengeance or sexual fantasies or even something foolish like, what would it be like if I won the lottery? Oh, man, you could work out the budget. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the thoughts of foolishness is sin. Okay. <laughs> I know, it's just crazy, isn't it? Because a lot of people are at peace with all kinds of folly. Okay, now look, there are, uh, you know, God doesn't want us to, you know, never have any pleasure or anything like that, but when you give your thoughts completely to vanity, Candy Crush or Minecraft or whatever, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? I don't know the latest games, but You got a sanctuary with nothing in it. What good is a sanctuary with nothing in it? What is a sanctuary for? Worship. Worship. You know what's emptied out a lot of churches that are real? They may as well not come because if you don't have it in here, what would ever draw you here? What are we doing? Putting on a show? No. We're here for God. We're here to worship God. We are here to give our life to God. Someone says, I've already done that. I know. But ten times through the week, you tried to take it back. Come back. Everything in the world is trying to destroy and disqualify Christians. And, you know, so, you know, there's how many scriptures? Okay, I want to show you an interesting scripture. How many scriptures are about just about the sin of planning evil? Okay, so you get in an argument with a person. <laughs> now, I have this blessing, and it's a curse. I've got a quick tongue and a quick wit. So you get in an argument with a person, and then you, a half hour later, you're running through the argument, and you go, I should have said this, because it would have really made them feel bad, you know. And it's like, God, forgive me. Actually, I come to the point one day where I realize, oh, God, you didn't let me think of that. It was so obvious. It was like a softball. I could have hit it out of the park. But you didn't even bring it to my mind, because you don't want me to sin. See, I'm going to say something about sins of the mind. They are... They, uh, people relish them. Like if you got a butterscotch and you unwrap it, it's hard candy. And you roll it around and around and around and around your tongue. So it's not just one or two bites of enjoyment. It's hours and hours of enjoyment. And it goes right down here and then you can't get rid of it. Okay. And you wish you could. See, it was so good, though. I, I just loved it. It was just delicious. So somebody has a fight or a strife with a person, and they can think over and over again. Then they said this, and man, if I would have said that. Bam! Why can't I be quicker-witted? Why can't I have a sharper tongue? So then you find yourself wishing you were more strifeful, more sinful. Or you have, now this is a curse too for the inner man. I mean, you can have experiences in sin that come back to your memory. Now the devil's in that too. Just remember that time you did this and that and the other. And wasn't that wonderful? Oh, wow. You could relive that and not be guilty because you didn't do it again. You just relive again. Well, you are guilty. Uh, I'm talking about a serious subject. And I'm telling you, you cannot have a good conscience if you don't have a pure mind, a pure heart. Now the good news is there's things we can do. This is, this is another reason for constant church and the word of God and the Lord's Supper and worship. We're trying to purify our souls. Peter says, fleshly lusts make war on the soul. 
fleshly lusts are at war on the soul. You think you're going to be a Christian? I'm going to bring back every sexual experience you ever had and run it through your mind until you can forget God. You can just forget him. That's the devil, right? You think you're going to be a loving Christian? I'm going to remind you of that person that really hurt you. They put the knife in your back. They twisted it. They betrayed you. And then they said this and that. And did you hear what they said last week about you? I'm telling you the devil is making war on our souls through fleshly lusts. And what he wants to do is fill our mind. Now, look at first, uh, Psalm 36, verse 1. A very unique verse. Always really like this verse. The transgression of the wicked saith... What? Transgression speaks? He personifies sin and has it having a conversation with you, with you. See, what are we talking about? Well, the modern t expression is self-talk. We all talk to ourselves. What does transgression actually say to the wicked? That no fear of God. You don't have to be afraid of God. God doesn't know. He's too busy running the universe. He does not know what you are entertaining in your mind right now. Believe me, there's a lot more important things than that. He flatters himself in his own eyes to, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. See, he, the iniquity just keeps growing, see, and morphing into something very powerful and very obvious. But the point I wanted to make is this first section, transgression talks to people. And one of the things it says, this says this many times in Psalms, God doesn't see, God doesn't know. He's too busy. He's, he's on a bigger scale than you. He's too busy. Well, God knows everything. God is good. But he knows everything. And to plan evil... Like uh, one of the things the Lord hates the most. Look at Proverbs 6. Now I pray to God that he will take this message and make sense of it to you. This disjointed message. And breathe his breath of life on it. For believe me when I say that I bring it with a good end in mind. The Bible says the goal of our teaching is love, pure love, true faith, not fake faith, true faith, and a good conscience. What he wants is good. I, didn't, I don't bring a teaching just to it just crush someone in the ground and make them feel terrible. The whole thing is for a good conscience, and I'm going to show you again, and I will never tire of it. How God has provided a way for us to minister to our own conscience. Proverbs 6, though, first, verse 16. Now look at this and tell me, how many of these sins are external sins and how many are internal, okay? Proverbs 6, 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, <laughs> just being proud look, God hates. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. You know, <laughs> I want to say something about imagination. That too is a gift of God. I'll grant that. It is a spiritual apparatus. But rarely does the Bible ever say anything positive about it. You know, in our culture, it's like, follow your imagination. It's so cute, so good. These kids have such imaginations. There's nothing impossible if you could just dream it. You know, listen to Disney and stuff like that. It's preaching a different gospel. Most of the time in the Bible, since the fall, vain imaginations, idols themselves are imaginations, Imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Imaginations that justify sin. Imaginations that scheme against innocent people. Imagination is rarely spoken of in a positive. You don't see Paul saying, now Timothy, you've got such a good imagination. I'm sure you're going to come up with some new doctrines that we never heard before. No, <laughs> not really. Because of the fall, that capacity is seriously damaged. 
and creates serious problems. For example, idols are imaginations, literally imaginations. Projections of imaginations. Idols, the heart is an idol factory. It crank, we can put anything before God and we're constantly looking for things to put before God. Because for some people, dealing with God himself is just too much. I mean, he's, he's real. He's, he's personal. You know why people want to have impersonal forces like the Star Wars, the Force and all that? Impersonal forces you can deal with. Because you can learn the laws and control and manipulate them. You can't control God. <laughs> Impersonal forces don't make moral demands on you. God does. <laughs> okay. So that's always a sign of a false faith system, by the way, when they try to depersonalize God. I remember uh, this is like at the time in the 70s, a little book, and it was a million seller, and it was called God's Creative Power Will Work for You by Charles Capps. And I thought of that. A million people want to figure out how to make God's power work for them. You know what, you know what the technical term for that is? Witchcraft. Witches. God hates witches, by the way. Okay. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, he that sows discord among brethren. See, it really matters what you think in your mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, I just want to close once again by just going over. The Bible talks about the conscience and God being greater in your heart. And God can deal, God can deal with this stuff if we will. And remember that the word conscience is a compound word, both in the Greek and the English. It just means with knowledge. Like there's things we know consciously up here, and then there's things we know here. And those things we know here are about ourselves and our moral status for good or evil. It's, an inter it's, it's like God gave us a very sensitive instrument inside the heart of every person that makes judgments on yourself or excuses yourself. And that's valid too. There are some things that people try to make you feel guilty for and you don't have to. And your conscience can help you there. Okay, that's a lot of the New Testament. People trying to impose uh, burdens on men's conscience that God didn't impose, right? So anyway, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 9 something so radical and beautiful. The blood of Jesus Christ can purge our conscience. Now there's so much, as, so, as always in the Bible, so much in so few words, right? The blood of Jesus Christ. Did we not just commemorate our share in the blood of Jesus Christ? can purge our conscience. You mean, I have a knowledge of something about me that comes between me and God. And I just can't stand it. I hate it that there's something between me and God. I don't want it. Well, the gospel is the blood of Jesus Christ, the death that Jesus offered as a sacrifice to God, is so powerful and effective, it can actually remove the barrier between God and I. Like, I didn't die for that sin, but Jesus did. Now I can have a good conscience. The beautiful passage in Hebrews, let us come with, to the, with a good conscience and a heart purified and our hands washed and worship, let us worship. Now, but first of all, let me, let me go through a few things. Okay, number one, if you uh, are convicted right now and, and, and you want to be purified, I'm not here just to lay the lumber on anybody, but to show you the way. You, you must confess and forsake your inner sins. That's the first thing. Now, there's a beautiful uh, passage, I won't have you turn there, in Isaiah 55, very common, about repentance. He says, let the... 
wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous his thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. Number two, and there's a whole doctrine, which we won't go through today, but called mortification. Will you practice a spiritual discipline of shutting the door on evil thoughts? You judge them and shut the door on them. If your habit is to fill yourself with immoral, filthy thoughts, do what Jesus did. Get behind me, Satan, thou shalt not commit adultery. The word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the sword of the spirit. Is this not spiritual warfare that we're talking about? Just practice the spiritual discipline of letting, not letting spiritual uh, immoral thoughts take root in your head. And I often quote the famous reformer, Martin Luther, when he, when he was teaching about that, he said, uh, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you don't have to let them make a nest in your hair. And I thought, that's a, that's a good strategy, you know. No, I'm not, I'm not going there. I am not an adulterer. I am a redeemed Christian washed in the blood of the Lamb. I will not have an adulterous inner life, okay? This sanctuary is for God, to worship God, and I'm not going to do it, okay? And then, you know, that goes along with another one. Treasure the Word of God. One of the greatest psalms in the Bible is one of the longest, Psalm 119. How shall a young man keep his way pure? The answer, taking heed thereto unto thy word. Thy word, Psalm 119, verse 10 and 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. See, so many people have problems because they have a void there. And there's no need for a void. There's no need. I remember one time a sister testified here and said, look, I get so stressed and troubled and all the news of the world and everything like that. And it was really getting me down. One day I just turned on Christian music. She says, I couldn't believe how peaceful I was. You know, what is those things for? We've got a battle and there's nothing wrong with filling your heart with praise, worship, edification, let your thinking be set on things above, not on things of the earth. And then you gotta, you gotta flee evil attractions. You got to, like it says in Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Run, remember Joseph, run. He's a red-blooded Hebrew boy and he's being tempted powerfully by an Egyptian princess. And he's, he did the right thing. He ran. And uh, go to Psalm 19 and then we'll close. Psalm 19. So much more that we can say about that. But I think this is sufficient for now. And I pray to God for the purity of heart of every one of us. But I want to take you to Psalm 19. And he says in verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I'll I be upright and I'll be innocent from the great transgression. Look, there's a, there's a progression there. It doesn't start with the great transgression. It starts with secret faults. He's scared. He's praying. Okay. Please keep me from that. I don't want to have secret faults. They're dangerous. And I don't want to have a presumptuous sin. What's that mean? You know it's wrong. You knew it was wrong. But those thoughts created a pressure where you just did it. You just went ahead and did it or said it or whatever. And he says, if, if you keep me from all that, it won't have dominion over me, presumptuous sins. Then I'll be upright and I'll be innocent from the great transgression. That is the thing to fear the most. The great transgression. The final and irrefutable repudiation of God himself. That's where all sin wants to take us. 
And then he prays this prayer that I'm going to close with. Let the words of my mouth. This is a good prayer to learn. And the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength. <laughs> 